Greetings. In several minutes, you'll be listening to the most vital, powerful message by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones on the topic of revival. It's from Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. So open up your Bibles to prepare yourself to listen and consider what the doctor is claiming. And I'm going to suggest to you the doctor is a Christian preacher. And when the preacher gets behind the pulpit, the word of God is being poured out upon the congregation. You can kind of close your eyes and just think there you are in this huge sanctuary at Westminster Chapel in London. And the doctor is preaching. And the doctor is preaching where this is different because it's the voice of God coming through a man. And that's what a preacher is. That's what a pastor is called to do. Not to give his opinion but to be faithful to what the scriptures are teaching. And so I think you'll find it quite edifying, quite challenging, quite illuminating, all the things that a sermon should be. And what's interesting is this particular sermon is actually not part of the doctor's series of sermons on revival. If you go to the doctor's website, you'll see a category of revival, and there was, I believe, 24 messages. But this message is in Ephesians is not part of that group because... It was separate. It was different. And so what I'm suggesting to you is it's likely that many have never even heard it, but you'll be blessed by it. I also want to mention from the outset that I'm dedicating this message to the people of the eastern shore of Maryland, those that are Christians, those that are inquirers of Christ. You're wanting to know whether the gospel and the, this book called the Bible is actually true, or perhaps you're just listening to this message out of politeness because we're friends though you're not a Christian, and but out of, out of friendship, you're going to take the time to listen to this message, and I thank you for it. And I do hope that it stirs your soul, and quite honestly, that, that you recognize that you have a soul, that there is life beyond the grave, that you're not here by time, chance, and matter. And so I'm glad that you're listening. And I'm dedicating this message because it's likely that my family and I, we've called this place home for 18 years, We'll be moving up to New Jersey. And because northern New Jersey has uh, been a hot spot of this virus here on uh, March 29th, 2020, and I start on Monday, um, I'm not going to be able to see you because when I come back to Maryland, I'm going to have to quarantine myself from you all so that nobody can get infected in case I, if I'm carrying it. Of course, I've got to protect uh, Tammy and Noah as well. And so we have to be prudent, don't we? But we're also living, what I want to mention, is that we're living in very critical times because our church doors are closed today. See, if you're listening to this message 30, 40, 50 years, and I've been long gone from now, during this time might be a, a very pivotal time for the Christian church, for the remaining Christian communities, because there's so few today. Because what has happened, I think, what I fear is going to happen, is that we have shown ourselves that the church is no longer essential, that we're part of the non-essential group. I want to encourage you to think this through, and there's an article published on Pilgrim's Progress about how the church should think through living through a pandemic. And the author has, uh, makes a scriptural argument, he makes an historical argument about what the church's response is during times of persecution and, and, and pandemics, and what has the church responded to by in the past. But let me turn my attention now to the matter at hand, which is, the if you know me at all, is this great need for revival. And I make no apologies for it. The greatest need of this hour, and has been going on for quite some time, is for revival. And the question, though, is, is what is revival? I'm going to deal with it in the positive. And the way that I want to deal with it first is this. What is the result of a revival? And you might be surprised by this. And this comes, and I highly recommend this book, called Pentecost Today by pastor and author Ian H. Murray. Pentecost Today, you got plenty of time to read. I know that you do. You can get it from Banner of Truth. Pentecost Today by pastor Ian H. Murray. Now, this is what a revival is. This is an outcome of revival, and then I'll give you the definition. The fruits of it, and many are, godly sorrow for sin, universal hatred at it, renouncing their own righteousness, and embracing the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ, embracing him in all of his offices, universal reformation of life, 
a superlative love to our blessed Redeemer, a love to all they see bear his image, a love towards all men, even their enemies, earnest desires and prayers for the conversion of others. That is the outcome of revival. Every revival in the history of mankind has always produced this outcome. It is consistent. Men and women are consistent, but God is consistent. And this is the result of a revival. Nothing more and nothing less. Now, why do I point this out? Because there are many within the Christian family who believe it's wrong to even pray for a revival, and Ian Murray in his book deals with it. I'm not going to deal with the negative. I'm going to stay in the positive. But in reform circles, there are some who look at revival and say it's led nothing but to emotionalism and confusion. In fact, it's even wrong because you're in Christ, therefore you have the Spirit of Christ. It's even wrong to be praying, to be filled with the Spirit because you have the Spirit already. Well, Ian Murray uh, uh, gives the biblical argument and explains why that view is not completely founded. There's truth in the view, but it's not completely scriptural. And then there are those who are so man-centered, they think that revival could come about through obedience. So we go from one extreme to another extreme where we don't pray for it at all. And then we go to another extreme where we say, no, 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 uh, God will bring revival if we are obedient. In other words, God brings revival as, out of a response. And so in both views, Ian Murray will show why they're scripturally flawed. And what he calls really the sound view is what's called the old school view. And the old school view on revival is this. It is a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It is a greater measure of the Holy Spirit. And Christ who governs his church. Christ who says, the Bible says of him, that the, that the Spirit of God in Christ was given without measure. In other words, the fullness of the Spirit is within Christ, and he decides how to pour out his Spirit in the measure of it. So in while, there, while in every Christian that is born again, that's the very definition of a Christian, isn't it? That you're a new creation, that you're actually born again, um, the Spirit resides, but it's not necessarily to the measure or intimacy that we should desire. So, what is the results of a revival? It's what I read to you. It's a conviction of sin, of godly sorrow, a universal hatred of it. Um, it's renouncing our own righteousness, embracing the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ. It's embracing him in all of his offices. In other words, he's not just Savior, but he's Lord, he's King. Uh, this universal reformation of life superlative love to our blessed Redeemer and a love for all of mankind, even our enemies, and earnest desires and, and prayers for the conversion of others. That is the result of revival. And I say it again because anything that doesn't match that is not a revival. All the silliness that you might see around you that people call it revival is not a revival. Number two, what's the definition of revival? It is the old school definition, is the biblical understanding, which is a great measure of pouring out the Spirit of God upon his people. That is revival. The Spirit of God, in a, in a significant way, is being poured out on his people. It is an act of God, not an act of man. All you and I can do is prepare ourselves for it. We can't create it. It is entirely a work of of God. So if we can understand the results, and if we can understand the basic definition of revival, then we won't go wrong. And then if we can also understand, as the doctor will show us in this sermon, that it's not something that we create, but it's something, a work that God does, and what we can do is prepare ourselves for it. Now, I also want to point this out to you. You might say, oh yes, well John, we're, we're either in a state of revival or we're in a state of decline within the church. Well, that's not true either. No, no, no. The church, we as Christians, can have good, solid spiritual health and a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and and walking in the Spirit, live our lives being sanctified and growing more like Christ, right? And good, solid spiritual health. And if that is you, I want you to be encouraged, my friend. No, no, we can walk in Christ and have good spiritual health without revival. But what I'm going to suggest to you today is that we don't have good spiritual health, do we? And that's why I pray for revival, that there will be a conviction of sin, there will be illumination of God's word, that more work with God being within our midst that can happen in five minutes than is what's happened in the last 50 years, because that's another attribute of a revival. It's another result. There's greater understanding where when revival comes and God is within your midst, your Bible comes alive to you. And why do I want the Bible to be alive to us? Well, because we're spiritually unhealthy. Now, I may not be talking specifically about you, meaning that like, like what I'm saying is not true about you, but these things that I'm saying to you, though, it evolves you. It evolves your congregation, whether you're Baptist, Presbyterian, or Methodist, non-denominational. It involves, it touches every community. There's not a Christian congregation on the Eastern Shore that is not impacted by this unhealthiness that continues to go on from year to year, decade to decade. And that's why I claim that the greatest need of this hour is for a revival of Christian people. It is the church that awakens up. Well, the question, though, is is then, well, why hasn't there been a revival? What are the signs of a revival is coming if it is a work of God? Well, One basic reason why there has not been a revival, and one of the ways that we'll know that a revival is coming, is because Christ will be front and center again. You see, friends of the Eastern Shore, don't you miss Jesus Christ? Don't you see how you hide him? You're Roman Catholic, you hide Christ. You hide him behind your Virgin Mary and all your all your uh, traditions. Oh, you mention his name. I don't. I'm not suggesting that you don't. But you exalt other things other than Christ. And all my Protestant friends, which I am a Protestant, I'm an Evangelical Reformed Protestant. You say yes and amen. But don't you see my liberal friends within the Protestant community? Presbyterian, Methodist, and and others, and Baptists, and others. You hide Christ behind your good works. You're seekers of the truth. You're always talking about how you're seeking the truth, but you never find the truth. You're always seeking it. Truth is always evolving. Oh, in your mind, uh, you accept all people just as they are. There's no need for new birth. We just kind of clean each other up, if you will. And you show great love for and care for people. I don't deny that. You do. But you hide Christ behind your good works. You're not listening to what he says. There's no conviction of sin. There's no new birth. I mean, what good is it if, a, if you clean up a man or a woman and they are living what you deem as a more successful life and they're accepted regardless of decisions that they're making in disobedience to God, and then they die in their sins and spend eternity into hell. What did you accomplish? But my point being is, you hide Christ behind your activities. You distort the gospel. You pick and choose what you desire. And you're creating a God that does not exist by doing so. And my conservative pro- Uh, uh, Protestant friends say yes and amen, but aren't you doing the same thing? Don't you hide Christ behind your activities, though they are different activities? I mean, when the preacher says a strong point, you know, you're in an evangelical, reformed, Baptist, uh, Presbyterian church, and the preacher makes a solid biblical argument, and the whole, and you see the truth, and the truth is proclaimed behind the pulpit, and you say amen, and you applaud the truth. But at that moment, the pastor should just stop and say, listen, truth is not meant to be applauded. 
Truth is not meant to be saying yes and amen. Truth is meant to be applied. Biblical truth is meant to be applied because you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God takes that truth that the preacher is preaching He illuminates your mind. That truth then grips your heart, and by gripping your heart, your affections and desires change into obedience, and therefore the truth is applied. That's what Romans 6 says, by the way. The Spirit of God moves, illuminates your mind, that truth grips your heart, and by gripping your heart, you become obedient to the Word of God. Don't you see whether even if it's conservative or evangelical or reformed, that if all we're doing is man's activity, in other words, you're doing things in order to make yourself a Christian. Christians do certain things. We go to church. We attend Sunday school. We buy books on theology. Uh, We might read church history. We read sermons. Um, We sit under the preaching of the Word of God. And we, we homeschool. Oh, yes, we homeschool. And, and, and there's all these other, and we're very moral people, you know. And, and so we do all of these things. But my friend, if there is no new birth, it's just a charade. You hide Christ behind it all, behind your good efforts. Apostle Paul says, I have no confidence in the flesh. The reason I know the, um, the, the church in America which includes the eastern shore of Maryland, is in serious trouble is because we have so much confidence in the flesh. It, there is a sense that it's a curse to be an American because we're so stinking successful. We can accomplish so much without God, and we've gotten accustomed to it. We're used to it. God says to Moses and the people, now listen, I'm going to keep my promise. You go on, I'm going to give you the land of milk and honey but I'm not going with you. And the people and Moses were cut to the heart because they didn't want to go on without God. Here in America, we say, hey, that's fine. We'll go on without you. Just give us the land of milk and honey. And we hide Christ behind our activities. Regardless of your denomination, you got to get back to your founders because they'll show you Jesus Christ. You're Baptist. You don't have to listen to me. But please listen to Spurgeon, Bunyan, your Methodist. Okay, fine, don't listen to me. But can you listen to George Whitfield or even John Wesley? I mean, Wesley preached new birth and justification by faith. You Methodists are not preaching the way Wesley preached. You're not even trying. I say the same thing to the Baptist and you Presbyterians. Get back to Calvin. Read his sermons. You, you read your sermon, and you read his sermon, and you'll see the difference. You can buy all of his ser- or, or the sermons that are available that have been found from Banner, but if you read him, you'll see what real preaching is. We don't, they don't hide Christ. Christ is in front and center. They bring him out so that you can see him and hear him. There's a man who's a minister of a non-denominational church, a faithful minister. He preaches the word. And I'm not going to get this exactly right, but he says when he preaches, when he prays, he asks the Lord to bless the teaching and the preaching that he would fade away behind the cross so the people might see Jesus Christ. That he would fade away behind the cross so that people would see Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters of the Eastern Shore, there's a great spiritual battle that is going on. I'm very concerned for your spiritual health, for the spiritual health of even my own family and of even myself. And the answer to our solution is we need to see our Savior again. We need Jesus Christ. We've got to stop playing games at the cross. There are things that we have to admit about ourselves that we don't want to admit. And it's time to confess those sins and the arrogance of our ways and the hardness of our heart and the stiff stiff neckness of our, of our neck. If we were to set out to try to destroy Christianity in America, well, we've done a very good job if that's the goal. It is a complete breakdown. 
Pastors have lost confidence in the Word of God because they're trying to win people over by their power of their personality and storytelling. And the people assemble together without even preparing themselves to hear the Word of God. It's a complete breakdown. This is a time for mourning. This is a time for seeking God to forgive us of acting so foolishly. And that is why we need a revival. I explained the results of revival, and anything different is not a revival. I've given you the meaning of a revival, and I've told you why there hasn't been a revival, because we hide Christ. And when men behind the pulpit stop hiding Christ, and that Christ is present, that's when I'll know that the Spirit of God is moving and working within men, and that perhaps revival is coming. In other words, there are little signs that you'll see before revival comes. One of those signs is the preaching begins to change. And maybe you pastors who have closed your churches, well, you know, now this kind of gives you time to go back and look back and see what I'm saying if it's true about the founders of your faith, your denomination. Christ is the founder of our faith. We understand that. I mean, we all agree that it doesn't really matter. Spurgeon said it right. It doesn't matter what our denomination is. The fundamental question is, are you a true Christian? Are you born again? That's the question. Well, this is a 20-minute introduction to a 50-minute sermon. <laughs> but I don't think you'd expect anything less from me um, if you know me at all. But this is my message to all my friends of the Eastern Shore. Grace upon grace be with you. And I want us to see each other again in this life. And I certainly want to see all of us in God's celestial city together. Where we'll be worshiping God and serving him for all of eternity. For he alone is worthy. Grace upon grace be with you all. to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians in the fourth chapter, verses 4, 5, and 6. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. I want particularly again to deal with that fourth verse. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. I want to consider that statement, particularly this morning, in the light of that account which we have read together in the second chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles, of what happened on the day of Pentecost at Jerusalem. Now, this is a day perhaps when most in the church not only think of the Holy Spirit, but also of the whole question of the unity of the Christian church. It has become to be regarded as the kind of festival of the church which emphasizes this aspect of unity. And that, of course, is perfectly right and perfectly good as long as we approach it in a scriptural manner and not merely in a sentimental manner. Now, we therefore can best approach this subject perhaps by taking it in the way in which the Apostle puts it in writing to the Ephesians. Having reminded those people of the doctrine, he now pleads with them and exhorts them to walk in a manner which is worthy of the calling to which they have been called. And especially he asks them to keep and to guard and to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And the way in which he helps them to do that, you remember, is this. He proceeds to expound to them the doctrine of the Christian church, the doctrine of the nature of the Christian church. 
And he starts off in those three verses, verses 4, 5, and 6 of that fourth chapter, by laying down certain fundamental postulates about which there can be no argument or discussion. They are the basic facts on which our faith is built and on which the whole Christian church is founded. The work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Son, and the work of God himself, the Father. So that the unity that belongs to the church is a unity that derives from the unity that is in the blessed Holy Trinity. The three persons in one. One God in three persons. Well now we are looking at the moment at this first statement uh, concerning the unity which is in the fourth verse. Which uh, is around the particular person and work of the Holy Spirit. There is one body, says the Apostle. And we've worked out together how the unity of the church can be thought of, and indeed must be thought of, in terms of what is true of the unity of the physical frame. It's an organic unity, not a mechanical unity. You don't just add parts together to make a body. The parts of the body come out of the whole. It's an organic, vital, central, spiritual unity. And then we began last Sunday morning to consider this whole subject of unity in terms of the Holy Spirit himself. One body and one spirit, he says. He's a person, he's not an influence. You can't divide him, you can't talk about portions of him. He himself is present as a whole or not at all. And uh, we further saw that all the work of the Holy Spirit, of necessity, produces a unity. Now, last Sunday morning, we were dealing with what we may call, for lack of a better term, the ordinary work of the Holy Spirit, or if you like, his regular work. For the work of the Holy Spirit can be divided into ordinary and extraordinary into that which is usual and that which is special. And it is a very important distinction to draw. Now, last Sunday morning we were dealing particularly with the ordinary work of the Spirit. His work in preparing us for the body of Christ. His work of conviction, imparting life, conversion, giving us faith and understanding, and then his work of incorporating, baptizing us into the body, and how he animates the body himself always. He came into the church and has remained in the church ever since. And then especially that work that he does in us as individuals. Where he produces his blessed fruit in us. And we saw that where the fruit of the spirit is there is unity. Because the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace. And long suffering and gentleness and goodness and meekness and faith and temperance, all these graces and manifestations of the Spirit of necessity produce harmony. And in the same way, he gives particular gifts to individual members of the church. As the Apostle teaches in the 12th chapter of the first epistle to the Corinthians, apostles, prophets, teachers, and so on, some have gifts of miracles, some of healings, some of faith, and so on. And there again he reminds us of the same thing. It is only as we realize that the gifts are from the Spirit that we have true unity. The moment we begin to think of them as something that we possess, or something for which we are responsible, there is division. And that is why they were divided in the church at Corinth, you remember. Some had very special gifts and others had very ordinary gifts. And the men with the special gifts were despising the ordinary, and the ordinary were envious of the special. And so the church was divided. And then they were dividing about the personalities of certain of their teachers. Some said, I am of Paul, others of Apollos, and others said they were followers of Cephas, and so on. In other words, failing to realize that every gift comes from the Spirit, they were attributing the gifts to the people, the person. And thus, they were causing division. Now, the answer to all that, the antidote to all that, is to realize that there is only one spirit. 
and that he is the giver of all these gifts. He dispenses them severally according to his own sovereignty and according to his own wisdom. Now the Apostle Paul has really put that once and forever in a great statement in his second epistle to the Corinthians in the fourth chapter and the seventh verse. He says, we have this treasure, this power uh, to preach and this understanding of the gospel. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He says, in effect, that that is why he was so often physically weak. That was why he was so often at the end of his physical tether, as it were, cast down, bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. It's quite clear that the Apostle Paul had a constant struggle in certain years of his life with physical infirmity, with weakness, disease of the eye and various other diseases conceivably. And that is his explanation. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He says, nobody can attribute it to me who knows me and who has seen me. I am what I am in order that it may be clear that the power that works in me and through me is not mine. It is the power of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the blessed Holy Spirit. Very well. Now then, there is what I have called and designated in general the ordinary work of the Spirit. But now this morning, and especially on Whit Sunday morning, I want to direct your attention to the extraordinary work of the Spirit. And here again we shall see that the work of the Spirit always promotes unity. And there is a sense in which this extraordinary work rarely manifests this principle even more clearly than does the ordinary work of the Spirit. Now, how does this happen? How does this uh, take place? What is this special work of the Holy Spirit to which I am referring? Well, you can put it, if you like, in one word. And that is the word revival. There are the ordinary operations of the Spirit that are going on constantly in the Christian church, Sunday by Sunday, from service to service, people brought, are brought under conviction. Believers are made to see their inadequacy, their unworthiness, stimulated to pray. The Holy Spirit is doing his work of sanctification in the church constantly. There's that regular work which goes on, I say, day to day and week to week and year to year. But there is also clearly taught in the scripture and in history an unusual and an extraordinary a special work of the Spirit. And this again, if you like, can be divided into two sections. You can regard it as general, and you can regard it as particular. Now, I mean by that something like this. When I talk about the general extraordinary work of the Spirit, I mean his extraordinary work as it is seen in the life of the church at large. And when I talk about the particular I mean the work of the Spirit in an unusual manner in individuals in the church. Very well. Now, I'm concerned this morning about this general uh, work, uh, the general extraordinary work of the Spirit, and I say it is called revival. And I do want to suggest this morning that there is no subject which is of greater importance or of greater urgency for the consideration of the Christian church today than this very subject of revival. If I have any understanding of the times at all, if I have any understanding of the biblical teaching concerning the nature of the church and the work of the Holy Spirit, I do not hesitate to assert this, that the only hope for the church lies in revival. I see no hope whatsoever in any other movement or any other organization or any other kind of effort. The one supreme need of the church is a revival. Well, what is a revival, says someone? Well, let me try to answer that question. Let me define it like this. A revival, I would say, is a repetition 
in some degree or in some measure of that which happened on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem the account of which is to be found in the second chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. It is a pouring out or a pouring forth of the Spirit of God upon a number of people at the same time. Sometimes it has been one church, sometimes it's been a district or a neighborhood, sometimes it has involved a whole country. Now that is what is meant by revival. And it is, uh, the effect of it in general is this. That the church is lifted up to a new level of experience and of understanding. And at the same time many outside the church or, or who are only nominally in the church are convicted and are converted and are brought into a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that is what I mean by revival. And uh, it's important that we should define it because there is an unfortunate tendency today on the part of many uh, to regard an evangelistic campaign as a revival and to announce it as a revival. We shall see as I proceed with my definition that that is an impossible uh, definition of revival. You can't announce a revival. You can't say that a revival is going to start next Thursday as these people do. They put up their posters and say revival meetings. It's impossible by definition. They mean an evangelistic campaign. And that is something entirely different from a revival. You may have a revival in an evangelistic campaign, but a revival is not an evangelistic campaign in and of itself. Very well then. What are the points that we have to consider? Well, the first one is this. There are many today who never even consider this question of revival. In fact, they disapprove of it. And they say that it is something which should not be preached about and certainly something which should not be sought. They're afraid of anything which may be designated as enthusiasm or fervor. Now, there are many reasons for this. I'm not going to keep you with the reasons. But uh, there is a type of sacramental teaching which makes the whole doctrine of revival quite impossible. I mean that kind of teaching which says that the Holy Spirit exerts his influence only through the sacraments, and that the sacraments are miraculous, that you receive Christ in the wafer, or that uh, you receive him through the water of baptism. Thus, you see, grace has been mechanized and has become something material, And that whole view of the church is that the church goes on receiving the grace and the influence of the Spirit through the sacraments and can only receive it through the sacraments. They have mechanized the working of the Spirit and they have tied it down to that and they exclude any other possibility. They regard what happened on the day of Pentecost as wild enthusiasm. Of course they don't say that, but that is what they really are saying in effect. And they're in difficulties about explaining it and understanding it. Everything is always in order and under the control of the priest. And it happens in this quiet way constantly and must always happen in that way. That's one school. But then there's another school. And the other school is sometimes evangelical. And uh, this uh, school uh, teaches something like this. They say, no, the Holy Spirit was given once and for all on the day of Pentecost. He came upon the church then and he came into the church then. And they say, it is wrong, therefore, that you should pray for an outpouring of the Spirit. There was only one outpouring, there can never be another, they say. And you mustn't even pray for that. The Holy Spirit is in the church All you've got to do is to surrender yourself to his influence and his power. And then he will fill you and all who do the same, and so the church will be filled with the Spirit. But they say you mustn't ask for an outpouring. You mustn't ask for God to send and shed forth again the Spirit as he did on the day of Pentecost. Well now, this is obviously very serious. Because if that teaching is right, there is really no room for revival. And we should certainly not pray for revival. But surely it's quite unscriptural. 
Surely in the Acts of the Apostles itself you are given teaching which shows that that is quite wrong. For the Holy Spirit not only was shed forth and came upon and filled the church on the day of Pentecost, it happened subsequently. Indeed, in chapter 4 of this book of the Acts, we read this. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. That's surely a repetition of what happened on the day of Pentecost. Here are these apostles, disciples, and followers. They've been baptized and the Holy Spirit has come upon them on the day of Pentecost, but then they've been in prison because of their preaching. And they went back to the company and they all prayed together and asked God to have mercy upon them. And again the Holy Spirit came upon them. The very walls began to shake. And they were all filled again with the Spirit and boldly testified unto the resurrection. And of course you get the same thing happening in Samaria. You'll find it in chapter 8. You get it in the household of Cornelius. The Holy Spirit fell upon him and the assembled company as he had done on the day of Pentecost at Jerusalem. And Peter, even who was skeptical and hesitant, had to admit it when he saw that the Spirit had been poured upon them, even as on us, he says, at the beginning. And the same with those disciples you remember at Ephesus, the account of which is given in chapter 19. But, in addition to that, and outside the canon of the New Testament, there is the amazing history of the Christian church herself. Look at the subsequent history of the church and what you find. Well, alas, what you find is this, that the story of the church has not been one of a dead level of achievement. No, no. The history of the church has been a history of ups and ups and downs, ups and downs throughout these long-running centuries. Indeed, there is a sense in which it can be said almost that the history of the church is the history of revivals and of the waning of revival and the coming back of revival. Look at it, and as you look at to take a bird's eye view of church history, isn't this what you see? You see that great beginning in the book of Acts, the mighty power, the shaking things that happened, and then you find it gradually pass. And then you come to the dark ages, the dark middle ages, all that period of torpor and of lethargy and of lifelessness in the history of the Christian church. Then the brilliant, blazing Protestant Reformation, which was a revival, a return to the book of Acts, a restoration of this ancient power. And then again that seemed to pass and you get the Puritan era, which was again a great revival. And then the revival of the 18th century. And then the revival of the 19th century. Now that, I say, has been the history of the church. And therefore for men to teach that you should not look and long and pray for revival and expect it and look for an outpouring of the Spirit of God it seems to me not only to be unscriptural, but to be a denial of the very glory of the history of the church. Now, its importance comes out in this way. That it seems so clear that revivals are God's way of keeping his work alive. You get that even in the Old Testament. You get the children of Israel falling into sin, forgetting God and becoming indolent and slack. And then God would suddenly deal with a prophet or a king. And there'd be a revival. You have it in the time of Josiah. You had it in the time of Hezekiah. There are other instances of it. These are revivals. God manifesting himself. And so I say it has proved to be throughout the long history of the Christian church. There have been times when Christianity almost had come to an end and certain people were quite confident that the end had come and it's then that God comes in revival and the Moribund church is raised to a new period of reactivity. That's one principle and here's another. That there is nothing surely that so proves the supernatural and the divine character of the church. 
and that she is the work of the Holy Spirit so much as a revival. I hope to work that out in a few moments with you, but let me make my point and principle clear. There is nothing I assert in the whole history of the church that so stamps upon her her supernatural, divine, miraculous character as revival. It is there you see that it is the power of the Spirit that matters, and matters alone. And therefore, as the result of that, there is nothing that so promotes unity as a mighty spiritual revival and reawakening. Now, that's the thing I say that we are concerned about. That is the thing that is preached about today. But the tragedy is that men think of unity in the church in terms of organization, not in terms of this power of the Spirit. It is the Spirit alone that can produce unity. There is no unity apart from him. You can have a kind of coalition. You can have men agreeing not to differ. You can get men coalescing, as it were. But that isn't unity. Unity is always something vital, energetic, organic. And it is only the Holy Spirit of God that can produce it in the church. Well, now then, bearing that in mind, what is it that the history of revivals really does teach us? Well, the first thing that strikes one who ever reads this history must be this. And it brings out this point of unity so perfectly. The history of all revivals is almost identical. Now that is truly an astonishing thing. Now you can't say that about the history of men. There are differences in the reactions and the behavior of men in general from age to age and from country to country. There are local customs, there are national customs, there are characteristics that belong to one century that don't belong to another, and so on. Mankind is divided up. The Bible is full of that teaching. But the remarkable thing about every revival is that it seems to be exactly like every other revival. It doesn't matter when it takes place. It doesn't matter whether the revival is in the first century or whether it's in the 16th century or the 17th or the 18th or the 19th or the 20th. It's always the same thing. I defy you to read the history of any revival without being reminded of the second chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. It's always a return to that. It's always a return to this first century Christianity. Why? Well, because it's the work of the same Spirit. There is only one Spirit, and He always does the same thing. But it not only applies to all centuries, it applies to all countries. Now, I believe these details are of great importance. I, I revel in them because I know of nothing that is more strengthening to faith than just to observe these facts. Now, look at it like this. Take the history, for instance, of the Reformation of the 16th century. Now, that Reformation took place at the same time in Germany, in Switzerland, in France, and in this country. Now, is that an accident? Is that something that can be explained in human terms? It doesn't matter where you see it, whether it's in Germany, whether it's in Switzerland, in France or in England, you see precisely the same thing. It cuts across national barriers. It demolishes all these national distinctions. We've got that perfectly, of course, in this second chapter of Acts. There were these Jews and proselytes together at the Feast of Pentecost. They'd come from various countries, and they had the characteristics of those countries. And yet here you see they're all made one, as it were, by the Spirit. It's always the characteristic of a revival. And then I say it not only does it in all countries, but the remarkable thing is the way in which it happens at the same time. As I've said there, in the 16th century, at the time of the Reformation, this self-same thing happened 
in those differing countries at the same moment. Then when you go on to the 18th century, you get exactly the same thing. In 1735, there was an outbreak, there was a revival in the United States of America, in the New England States, in a little town called Northampton, where the minister happened to be the mighty Jonathan Edwards. That's 1735. You remember what conditions of travel were 200 years ago? You remember that there was no wireless? You couldn't send a telegram? There were no newspapers as we know them? You hadn't got the postal system as we've got it now? It took months to cross the Atlantic, but there in 1735, this great awakening took place in Northampton in the New England States. And at exactly the same time, it took place in Wales in the same year, 1735. And still more interesting, it took place in two places in Wales in the lives of two men who'd never met and who'd never heard of one another at all. They only met two years later, and when they met they were astounded at the identity of the things that had happened to them. It happened in one village where there was an ordained clergyman, a curate, it happened in another place, about 70 to 80 miles away, in the life of a man who was a schoolmaster and was never ordained at all. But the same thing happened to the two men at the same time, and they were led to do the same things. And it was only two years later, I say, that they met. Well, now, let us look at these facts. You see, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Here he is, America, Wales, 1735. And then in 1737, the same thing happens in the life of George Whitfield and 1738, John Wesley and Charles Wesley. Within a few years, you see, of one another, this self-same thing happens. And in Scotland at the same time, in the lives of godly ministers and in churches, there was this movement of the Spirit. Surely, my friends, we must regard these things as remarkable and amazing that these Movements of the Spirit should take place at the same time amongst people who have no contact with one another at all. And of course in the last century it happened again. In 1857 a great revival broke out again in America, came to Ulster, came to Wales and parts of England in 1858 and 1859. Now, the point I'm making is this, you see, that you can't explain these things in human naturalistic terms. It's the one spirit operating in his church, there, here, separated and divided, but he does the same thing at the same time, and indeed he's done it in this century. There was a revival in Wales in 1904 and 5, and also in Korea at exactly the same time, 1905 and 6. And so it has happened throughout the ages. My dear friends, I'm taking this time and putting these facts before you with the hope in my heart and in my mind that someone here will be awakened to see that this is how God acts and that this is the only hope for the church and that we must pray for this. Listen to more. What are the features and characteristics of a revival? Well, it's always what you read here at the beginning of this second chapter of Acts. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly, suddenly, yes, and often unexpectedly, these people were waiting because the Lord had told them that not many days hence this was to happen. So they were meeting in prayer of one accord and praying. They knew it was going to happen, but they didn't know when. Suddenly, but as you look at the subsequent history of the church, you can add to suddenly the word unexpectedly. And I thank God for this because it is to me the greatest consolation in this arid period through which we are living. You never know when the Holy Spirit is going to visit us and to revive his work. And you see the point I want to emphasize is this, that he comes. It is he who comes, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and they were 
and there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire. There came. It's nothing that men do. It's nothing that men can do. And that is something that comes out very plainly and clearly in the history of revivals. You will often find that God has used one particular person more than any others in a time of revival, and you will often find this, that the man he chooses is a man whom nobody would have chosen, no men would ever have chosen him. It isn't always some great or gifted or unusual men. It's sometimes some very humble and inconspicuous men. And God, the Spirit, comes upon him. Why? Well, to show that it's his work. No man can explain it in terms of the man or his gifts or abilities or personalities. No, no, it's in spite of the men. And then the honor and the glory must be given to the Holy Ghost, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. It comes. Oh, I do commend to you the reading of the history of revivals. You will sometimes find that it's happened like this, that a group of people, just a handful, who are almost breaking their hearts because of the state of religion in their district, because of the deadness and lifelessness of their church. They were almost at the point of giving in, perhaps, but still, out of a sense of duty, went on with their little prayer meeting or whatever it was, and they'd gone to the meeting more or less dejected and disconsolate. But there they were, and they were praying, and suddenly they were all aware that something had happened. The Spirit of God had come upon them, and they were transformed, and the meeting couldn't be finished as it were. On and on and on it went, and the people came in from everywhere to see what was happening. That's how God does it. That's revival. Suddenly, unexpectedly, it comes. And what is it? Well, it is always what you read of in this second chapter of Acts. They become aware suddenly of a presence, of a power, of a glory, of a sense of marvel. Watch that word as you read this second chapter of the Acts. They all were amazed and marveled, saying one to another. And even the people themselves are filled with this sense of wonder. You see, what happens at such a moment is this. That God the Holy Spirit makes his presence felt so rarely. That men and women who may have believed in God for years are suddenly aware with a new directness of the glory of God and of the majesty of God and of the greatness of God. It's no longer a matter of faith. There's a kind of directness. They feel and know that God is there. God seems to be filling the building. That's what happens. And, of course, this is something entirely beyond understanding and entirely beyond explanation. The church doesn't understand it. The world understands it still less. What is its effect upon the believers? Well, here it is. It gives them a new clarity of understanding. They began to speak. You remember we are told about the wonderful works of God. You know, my friends... Christian people in a time of revival have often said that they've seen things more clearly in a second than they'd seen in the whole of their previous life. I remember quoting to you an experience of John Flavel, the Puritan once, who had an amazing experience along these lines on his own, and he said that he learned more in that one experience than in the whole of his life of Bible reading, reading books about the Bible and prayer. The reality, the clarity, the luminosity of it all. That is what happens. And that is how the Holy Spirit, you see, produces unity. People who've been doubtful and uncertain and hesitant, and therefore arguing with one another, suddenly the Holy Spirit so fills them with understanding that they feel that they almost see the Lord Jesus Christ, and they know him as the Son of God and their Savior. They see the efficacy of his blood. It all becomes plain and clear, and it happens to all of them. That's unity. 
But the tragedy is today that men are trying to produce unity how well by telling us that it doesn't matter very much what we believe. That as long as we all come together and work together and don't argue about doctrine, we're all going to be one. No, no. Unity of the Spirit is through understanding, not through dismissing understanding and saying that understanding doesn't matter. The characteristic of every revival is that men understand the doctrine and understand the truth in a way they've never done before. Not only that, they begin to rejoice as they've never done before. They begin to be filled with an assurance, a sense of the certainty of their relationship to God. They know not what to do with themselves. They're so filled with joy that some people looking at them said, these men are drunk, they're filled with new wine. No, no, it's the joy of the Holy Ghost. They're thrilled with this new relationship to God. And then, of course, that leads to a desire to tell others. And they began to speak and to tell forth these wonderful works of God. And they did it with a power and a boldness and an authority that they'd never had before. The Peter who denied that he knew Christ but a few weeks before because he was afraid he was going to be put to death speaks here after this with this boldness and authority he chastises the Jews and condemns them and he holds them face to face with judgment power, boldness, authority isn't this the thing that's needed by the church today? what can we do with a generation such as this in which we find ourselves? with its pride of knowledge and of learning, its scoffing and its arrogance. You say, is it possible ever to shake the modern world? I say it is. The Holy Spirit can do it. Men cannot. But the Spirit can, as he did on that day of Pentecost, as he has done so often since in these periods of mighty revival. And you notice the sense of oneness which they had, didn't you? They all kept together. You see, they even sold their goods, and they lived a kind of communal life. Why? Well, they felt they were one. There was no mechanical unity about it. They were just one. Nothing mattered but this. They'd been fused into one. They'd been put into the body, as it were. They felt the Spirit overwhelming them all, and in and through them all, and they had all things in common. The unity is inevitable when the Spirit is thus present in power, and then you see the other side, don't you, the effect it had upon others. They came running together and said, what is this? And Peter preached, and they were convicted and broken down. These Jews who had said, away with Christ, crucify him, listening to the preaching about him by Peter, say, men and brethren, what shall we do? And you see, this always happens in times of revival. There are certain people whom you would be tempted to say, speaking naturally, that nothing could ever convert them. And no human power can, but the Holy Spirit can. These Jews who had crucified Christ were broken under conviction and cried out for mercy. And so it has happened in all the revivals in the church throughout the centuries. There is nothing, you see, that so attracts people to the church as revival. We are trying to advertise the church today. The church is setting up publicity departments. It's setting up publicity agents. We are told we must advertise the church to the people. My dear friends, if a revival broke out here or anywhere else, there would be no need to advertise it. People would come from everywhere. They'd say, what is this? It draws and attracts like a magnet. When the power of the Spirit is present, people come in amazement, perhaps in curiosity. And often it happens, as I'm saying, that fools who even came to scoff remain to pray. Very well, the final point I want to make is this. What are we to do about all this? Well, what is the way to revival? The way to revival is... We must realize our own impotence. We must realize that we ourselves can do nothing. The power is of God. The power is of the Spirit. 
What do we do then? Well, what we do is this. We must continue of one accord, and that means one in doctrine. The apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. Doctrine first. The Holy Spirit's work is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is no value in our prayers if we don't believe in him, in his unique deity, in his incarnation, virgin birth, miracles, death, atoning death, resurrection. The Spirit glorifies him. And we must therefore believe in him and be in one accord in our doctrine. And then we must pray. We must spend our time in praying for the Spirit as these people prayed for those ten days. And as you'll find in the history of the church throughout the ages, as God's people have prayed, being brought to see their own impotence and helplessness, they have just gone in the name of Christ their Savior and Mediator, and they've pleaded with God to pour forth his spirit again. But when they thought the end had come and there was no hope, suddenly he did it. Christian people, if you really are burdened by the times in which we live, if you are really grieving in your heart as you see the godlessness of the world that is round and about us, if you have a compassion in your hearts for men and women in the bondage of sin and of Satan, I tell you that your first duty is to pray for revival. When revival comes, more will happen in a day than may happen in a century of the ordinary work of the church. When he comes in this power, the stoutest hearts are broken, the mightiest intellects are broken down, and men and women cry out, Asking for mercy, seeking to know the way of salvation. The first task, the first duty of Christian people and of the Christian church today is to pray and plead for a repetition of this Pentecost, a Holy Ghost revival, God again coming in authority and might and power into the midst of his people. I charge you with this task. It is your responsibility as a Christian believer. The Holy Ghost is there still in all his power. Pray God to send him. And when he comes, we shall see things that will astound us and amaze the scoffing unbelieving world that is outside.